Okay, well, we welcome Ethan tonight, and we are very grateful that he's willing to share his experience, strength, and hope, and how the effects of marijuana impacted him. I am very proud to say that Ethan and I got to share a lot of great experiences. If you, if you logged on uh, a few minutes ago, you might have heard us chuckling about some of those. Um, but the one experience I'm really, really proud of Ethan um, and I that we got to do together as we both awakened the Cornerstone program last November. Uh, it was a phenomenal night and we did a little dance and after and had a lot of fun. So it was a good time. <laughs> Um, so Ethan, um, oh, the other thing I want to mention about tonight's share uh, that's really unique and special to Ethan that you don't always hear about is that um, Ethan went through this cornerstone program that I went through, um, and it's a very dynamic, intensive program, and he didn't have a lot of parental support through it, but he did it, and he leaned on the other adults in the, the program, He even, and he'll share more about that, the more details about that, but he, but he wanted to be sober, and he, he wanted to improve, and it was, it was a blessing. It was just phenomenal to watch him make those choices and to really dive into his recovery program and um, take care of himself. It's awesome. So thank you, Ethan, for being here tonight. I love you. I'm very proud of you. And the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, my name's Ethan. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Aubrey, for the amazing introduction. Um, my story kind of starts, obviously, um, when I was born. We're not going to go that far back. But um, uh, my childhood wasn't particularly um, fantastic. So my family has had a lot of struggle with alcohol and addiction. Um, growing up, I didn't really realize like what was going on all the time. Um, and I was kind of sheltered from it. But when I got to a certain age and figuring out that my family isn't normal, um, of course, I wanted to like lash back and um, try to try to fix it or correct it. And so uh, my mother has had a lot of problems with alcohol um, and drugs. Uh, my father with the same, a lot of issues and struggling with alcohol. Um, so I kind of watched my parents drink themselves to sleep every night. Um, and they ended up going through a very nasty divorce when I was 14 years old. Um, I have three older siblings. They are all girls. Um, it was like being raised with Wolverines. Um, they are extremely beautiful and they are doing amazing today, but when they were my age, they were not doing amazing. Um, and so they were kind of my role models and I'm not, I'm definitely not blaming them. All of my choices are my own, but I wanted to kind of follow them in their footsteps. And, and, uh, my sisters definitely had a hard time within, um, my family, uh, I watched my, Sisters really, really struggle. Um, I have a, uh, uh, just a lot of alcohol and um, addiction problems within my family and watched my sisters really, really struggle at school and um, a couple of trips to juvies and girls' homes. And so my family was extremely broken. And I'm the youngest by four years. Um, and so when I was 14, I was the only one left in the house. My youngest sister was 18 and she moved out and I felt pretty alone. Um, when my parents split up, I chose to go with my mother and um, things went very sideways very quickly. We ended up moving away from Spring, Texas, and we went up to the Woodlands, which is a much nicer and much safer area. Um but it was much easier access for me to get my hands on drugs and alcohol um, with a lot of the families up there accepting it. A lot of parents are up. To, a, a lot of parents in the woodlands are just like, Oh, weed is fine. Um, and, and we were able to get away with it much, much easier. And so um, living with my mother, she really, really struggled at this point and her addiction was going off the deep end um, she couldn't hold down a job and child support was running out. And so um, I found myself working a lot and skipping school. And so I started to help pay like some of the bills. Um, 
And there was a few reasons I did that one because I wanted to help my mother. Um, but the other was because, um, I'm codependent and I wanted to save her and I wanted to help her. And there's of course a few other reasons in the back end where it's like, um, if I live with my mother, then I'm allowed to smoke weed and I'm allowed to drink and I'm allowed to party. And if I lived with my father, I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, my father is much more strict. And so, um, I used my mother and was codependent and tried to save her. Um, and of course that did not work. A lot of hospital visits, a lot of really scary moments. Um, eventually my mom wanted to find change. She moved across the country to Hawaii and I ended up having to go live with my father. And at the time, me and my father were not on speaking terms. Um, every conversation turned into a massive argument and, um, a lot of walls were punched and a lot of, um, just very, very nasty things were said, um, living with my father for a couple of months. Um, he was very oblivious to the fact that, um, I was, that I was smoking and I was hiding things behind his back. Um, I was a very, very good liar at the time. Um, I was able to manipulate him and do whatever I wanted. And um, once I was caught, things were um, not so fun for me at the time. It was a total lockdown situation. My father did not know what to do um, with my sisters. And when he was when they were struggling, how he dealt with it then um, was the best at the time that he could come up with. And so um, he, he learned that that juvie and 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 a guy's home is is not the option for our family. It didn't work. It only pushes our family further away. Um, and so I was searched every single time I got from or every time I got home from school. And I moved all the way back to Houston. And so all my friends were in the woodlands, and I felt very alone. Um, on the last day of school, my father picked me up and drove the wrong way home. So we did not go south back to Houston. We went north and I went to Canton, Texas, and I went to a treatment center for the entire summer called Sundown Ranch. Um, Sundown Ranch was not my cup of tea at first. Um, they took my Jordans away. They took my fancy, my fancy jeans and they made me wear clothes that I did not want to wear. Um, they took my belt. So I was sagging my pants the whole time I was there for a little while. Um, and I was just not a happy camper. I was, did not feel like I needed to be in that treatment center. Um, I lied my entire way through. I was there for 75 days. Um, and I treated it like a summer camp. I was not interested in healing. I was not interested in bettering myself. I wasn't interested in sobriety whatsoever. Um, and so I found myself at the end of my stay at sundown. Um, I found myself with a dilemma. They gave me two options because obviously I can't stay in that treatment center forever. They said I can either go live with my father or I can host in this family within this cornerstone program that at the time I had no idea what it was. Um, they told me the rules. I was like, OK, I guess I can make that work. Um, because my hatred for my father was um, enough for me not to want to live with him. And so I didn't know if I was going to go live with Amish people or whatever the deal was, but um, I chose to go with Cornerstone. Um, and it was one of the best choices I've made in my life. Um, I'm extremely lucky for it. Out of the stupidity, the stupidity of my choices, that was one of the good ones. Um, I ended up living with a family for the first six months of my stay in Cornerstone. Not a whole lot of contact with my father. Um, he wasn't super interested with the Cornerstone program. Um, and I was more interested in finding a girlfriend and having fun and, and breaking into abandoned buildings or whatever, whatever I thought was fun at the time. Um, but I stayed because I found friends. I found people who accepted me. I found people who also struggled with drugs and, and, and covered their pain with drugs and alcohol. Um, and I found myself at this time, about six months in the program, my, my brain was starting to clear up a little bit. 
um, my struggle with marijuana was um, almost on a 24 seven basis while getting high. And it was my outlet. It was a way for me to escape my situation with my mother. Um, it was a way for me to be cool at school. Um, it was a way for me to just feel better about how I, uh, about my life because I felt so much self-pity, so much anger towards the world. Um, and it, and it was, and it was fun at first. It was, it was playful the first couple of times. Um, and eventually it just turned into an absolute obsession where it was, um, waking up, uh, waking up an hour early before I needed to leave for school just so I could go get high. And all of these lies and um, like deceptions that I had to put up in order to get away with it. Um, because, of course, the adults in my life did not want me to be doing this. And so uh, my life was just full of lies um, and it became my normal self. Nobody really knew who I was. Um, that was just kind of the norm was for me to be. Um, so mellow and um, not very talkative and, and that kind of thing, um, because after a while, they just kind of forgot what the normal Ethan looked like because I was um, under the influence um, so often. And so I was able to get away with it for a while. Um, but in Cornerstone, my brain definitely started to clear the fog, like the, the fog a little bit. Um, and it was a difficult time because I um, had a lot of those emotions that I covered up for so long, they started to come back. And so um, I was no longer able to like numb myself and um, the, the emotions were starting to become real. So I felt very hurt, very, um, very angry, um, left and abandoned by my family. Um, a lot of self-pity. Um, but I stuck around Cornerstone because I felt like that's all I had left. Um, at the time, like I said, my father wasn't super interested with the program. Um, at the time, my sisters were supportive of it because it said I because I said I wanted to do it. Um, but my family was just in absolute shambles. I mean, it just tore everybody apart. Um, I ended up living with um, Cornerstone families for another year and a half after that. So I hosted with these families for two years total because my family wasn't interested in the program. Um, and I was. And after that first six months, I started to become interested in bettering myself, learning how to help other people. I found purpose with um, all of the mistakes that I made in life. I found a purpose of sharing my story um, helping other teens and mentoring them and helping them get sober and helping them find friendships and opening up about themselves. Um, and it was very difficult for me because I had no idea what I was doing and I still don't half the time. Um, but I know what not to do. Right. Um, cornerstone was definitely a very, very good thing for me at the time. Um, and getting sober was a fantastic choice for my life. Um, Within working on myself and trying to build self-esteem and pushing myself, um, getting sober has just opened so many opportunities for me and in my life. Um, lots of epic bike trips and yoga challenges and so many friendships and memories that I've built in the past three and a half years of being sober. Um, it's just been fantastic. I mean, before... Um, before getting sober, I had nobody. I felt like I was alone in my own world. I had nobody I could relate to. And um, finding people who were on the same page as me was extremely uh, beneficial for me. Um, and today I have so many pillars in my life and so many friendships and relationships that I bank on. I completely surround myself with winners. Um, winners are people within the program that are... Um, that are actually sober and working programs and trying to better their lives and working on their self-esteem. Um, and so my life is just completely full of community, friendship, and love. And that's what I absolutely love. Um, a lot of those problems that I had within my life of getting high and hiding, um, I no longer live. I no longer have to live in a life full of lies. I no longer have to 
hide in the shadows and um, just kind of sit in my bed at night crying, wondering why I hate my life. Right. Um, and so getting sober has absolutely um, just changed my family dynamic um, completely revamped my relationship with my father. Um, I kind of was running out of homes to live in within Cornerstone. I kind of hit every single door that I could. I was sleeping on couches for two years. And um, while doing this, my relationship with my father has just gotten significantly better. And yet he's not super interested with the program. Um, He's supportive of me and what I want to do. And so um, paying for Cornerstone myself and trying to like complete and finish what I started was my goal. And it was extremely difficult because I'm really easy to give up on things when they're difficult. Um, but for some reason, I stuck through. Um, and so after two years, I decided to um, live with my father again and give that another chance. And it was amazing. Um, I got myself to a point where I could save up enough money. I got my own apartment in Houston. Um, and the, the apartment's nothing nice, nothing pretty. It's, uh, it's in a bad area, but, um, ended up getting over there for a year, um, making a lot of big leaps and a lot of big jumps within my life. Um, I'm 20 years old. And so it's, um, been a struggle on learning how to become an adult and learning how to do my taxes and, uh, like, not get swindled on buying a car and interest rates and all this stuff. Um, but I have so many people that I've met throughout, um, this program and so many friendships, um, that I can lean on whenever I am stressed or struggling with things. And I have so many adults and parents within the program that have teens who have struggled. Um, and so I kind of have my own mechanic within the program. I got my, I got my tax guys. I got all these people, um, which is just the plus, right? It's just the, it's just the good stuff. Um, it's not the good stuff, but it's, but it's just extra. It's helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, um, life has just really, really worked out for me. Um, mentored a lot of teens, helped a lot of kids get sober. Um, I tend to lean towards the drama mama teenagers. So I tend to, to put some stress on myself. Um, but I think that I have made impacts in those kids' lives. Um, today, I mean, of course there's struggle, of course there's stress. Um, but I have so many tools to help me work on it throughout my life. Um, yeah, I mean, I really, I really don't know what else to say. I mean, nothing's ever going to be perfect, but I mean, I mean, I just have so many blessings throughout my life today. So thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, so marijuana was mostly your drug of choice um, when you were using, and you said you were using almost every day. And and you were just completely numbed out, or were you feeling depressed, or can you describe a little bit about that? And and, and then you kind of talked about when you woke up, like you kind of came out of the haze. Is, did you not realize it, that you were that bad until you were so Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely the weed mask, um, how bad it was really getting. Um, I mean, there was, of course, a lot of depression, a lot of anger, a lot of self-hatred. Um, all, all of that was masked by a massive ego and a massive front of like, I'm OK, this is fine. Um, and the numbness, uh, like, of course, like no tears, um, didn't really have a whole lot of feeling. I mean the night that my mother left, um, she was like packing. This is just kind of like the realness of it, where it was the night that my mother left, um, to move away to Hawaii was a massive deal and a huge part of my life. Looking at that today, right? Like that, that would be such an emotional time for me. My mother moving away across the country that night that she was moving away, I had like 15 or 16 kids hiding in my room, all smoking weed, just waiting for my mom to get out the door so we could party. Yeah. Like I was completely out of it and completely out of my mind. And all of my decisions were based off of massive whys. Um, but definitely after I got sober, some of that cleared up and I was like, man, I was definitely really selfish. <laughs> um, and a lot of that depression and anger has had a lot to do 
with my recovery and having to work on that and using tools and burn letters and talking with my friends and opening up and crying and doing workshops and all that kind of good stuff. Do, do you have a relationship with your mother today? It's, it's, it's off and on. Uh, my anger and my, my resentment has faded away um, over a lot of time. Um, we aren't, uh, not a whole lot of contact. We talk to each other maybe about once a month, uh, maybe sometimes a little bit longer than that. But I mean, there was just such a massive gap within our relationship. I didn't talk to my mother for my first two years sober. And so, um, very little contact with my father throughout that time and zero contact with my mother. I mean, of course I felt, I felt very alone. Um, she is, she's better. She's better. Um, she's able to hold down jobs. She has her own apartment. She's kind of clearing up a little bit, but I think, um, when, even when you remove the drugs and alcohol, there's definitely times where, um, she doesn't have the tools and she doesn't have the support group and the people that I think that she really needs, but it's, um, it's not really me that needs to be there to save her, um, invited her to meetings and all that kind of stuff, but she's really not super interested in it. So, so, um, we'll open, we'll open up to the audience asking you questions, but I just have like one or two more. Mm -hmm. um, when you mentioned the word winners, I remember when I first heard that, what that term, when I came into, and, and we're not here to promote just cornerstone or anything like that. Everybody, um, uh, find a program, find a, anything that works for you. Um, we, we were just privileged to be part of this really established dynamic program that had a lot of healthy avenues. It is not, <laughs> by no means is it a perfect program. I mean, people have come and gone. And I think, you know, when, when I watched Ethan, he, he wanted to be sober and he did what he took to be sober. And like even living with strangers, you know, and, and, um, <laughs> you know, and, um, but um, you, the term winner, like, really kind of rubbed me the wrong way, especially when I first heard it. I'm like, oh, so all those other people are losers? Like, yeah. that's inappropriate. Why would you guys do that? And I got all, like, my uh, tail feathers ruffled by that. And um, um, and I, I, I just want you to talk a little bit about what winners mean and how, what the role that played with you, not just the youth winners, but the adult winners for you. Like, can you yeah. talk a bit more about that? Yeah. So when I first got sober, the, um, the group that I was a part of and the kind of the culture at the time was um, the easier way to put it was, okay, any dude that has like really long hair is a winner, basically. Um, and uh, that's kind of how I looked at it for the for the first couple of months um, of being sober, because um, we all just had really long hair at the time. Um, and so I wanted to grow it out to be like them. I just cut my hair yesterday. It was down way past here. Um, but yeah, so I guess I'm no longer a winner. But um, no, a winner for me, um, it definitely wasn't an easy concept to grasp at first. Of course, I was like, okay, so I'm a loser and I can't be trusted. I don't like that. And so there's a people, people have a different reaction to it sometimes where they're like, um, like, a, um, I know Josie, my girlfriend, her first reaction was, I'm not a winner. Well, I'm going to be the biggest winner. I'm going to be the best. And she like fought for her right to be like um, the most trusted or, or whatever. Right. And, and, and that might have a couple of good things to it. Maybe that'll help you help, help you. Um, but that definitely would not help me. Um, a winner for me is somebody who isn't going to sign off on my self-pity. A winner is not going to sign off and, and tell me that it's okay whenever I'm lying or hiding my feelings. Um, my winners today, um, I mean, there's a lot of people who will hold me accountable and hold me to what I say I'm going to do and that kind of stuff. But I mean, I have pillars throughout my program and I have best friends that I've, um, that were, that were the dudes that were there for me whenever I first got sober. So after three and a half years, they know me pretty well. They know when I'm feeling sorry for myself. They know when I'm hiding something, they know all my tells. Um, and so it's really easy for them to hold me accountable and stuff like that. Um, and of course, I mean, I got to listen. Um, 
with uh, um, what do you call it? I th when you were talking about um, the adult winners. cornerstone, um, yeah. I think that the um, kind of like I, I definitely didn't have to be within that group to get sober. Um, I think a lot of times, like when I'm at work or wherever I'm at, um, it's creating the culture that I crave is how I'm going to thrive, right? So um, I work in a restaurant and there's a lot of people who drink and a lot of people who do drugs and I don't hang out with any of them. Um, instead, I, I mean, this isn't the case for everybody, but I invited a bunch of my friends to come work there who were sober. And so I created my own culture there and the people that aren't my friends that work with me um, I really just hang out and talk to the ones that are like supportive of what I do and um, aren't complete. Well, I can't cuss, but um, yeah, creating the culture I crave definitely is I'm able to find winners throughout um, a lot of like different aspects of life. Um, there's people at like uh, at, at my job who don't want to do their job, who want to just sit there and be lazy. Um, and a winner is somebody who leads by example and pushes other people um to do their best in, in that kind of aspect so um yeah definitely a winner for me is somebody who holds me accountable pushes me and doesn't let me give up um and whenever i am sitting in self-pity and sitting in anger they're not just going to let me sit there um and do that they're gonna they're gonna call me a few bad names and, and they're gonna tell me to stop being <laughs> they're gonna tell me to get out of myself um and i'm really glad that i have people like that throughout my life so I think I answered the question. I might have missed something, but no, no, you did. And I think I think it's it's quite interesting. And I remember when you told this to me when you got that job at that restaurant, um, and you said you were bartending. My jaw just went like it just like yeah. I was like, "What, do you think you're doing? What?" He's like, "It's cool. I'm bartending. I'm cool. I I got my program." And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, I just can't," you know, and overreactive. You know, I'm not your mom, but like that's what I was. Yeah. Because I think all, a lot of the adults in the program, we feel like, oh, you know, Ethan, like we're kind of watching Ethan even more because his parents weren't involved. So, you know, there was a there was talk amongst the adults like, okay, well, did you support him with this? Did you do that? You know, and and it was cool to hear your host families talk, you know, and how they're supporting you and what they're doing and watching your growth in that. So I did have that reaction like a normal mother would like, yeah, what? <laughs> of course. I mean, I can't even take a legal drink. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reaction that I get at like a meeting or something like that, some people are just like, that doesn't really sound like a good situation. Um, but when, when people look at it from my perspective, it's like, okay, that, that's kind of the best job that I can get at my age um, because I don't want to make $10 an hour. Um, I, I, I got car payments. I got rent. I got, um, I got school to pay for. I got, I got stuff that I need to pay for. And this is kind of the best opportunity that I have. And I think that I've built something really, really cool within um, with where I work. I mean, at first it was a little bit rough. Um, <clears throat> my manager's like, are you sure you can't like just try the drinks? And I'm like, no. And they're like, can you like spit it out? I'm like, no, um, like that kind of stuff. It was a little rocky at first, but we've definitely, we've definitely made it work. That's awesome. And you, you have, I have watched you rent your own apartment, buy a car, you know, <laughs> take, taking good care of yourself. You, you've been adulting for a while. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience now. Does anybody want to make a comment or have a question? Uh, this is Bart. And uh, just, yeah, I really want to thank you, uh, Ethan. Wow. What a journey. So proud of you. So great job. Thank you. Anybody else? You can just unmute. I'll do it. Hi, Gabe. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm going to turn my video on. Okay. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. Um, my question is, what you were talking about there, Ethan, when I went through a, a different but similar thing, the way psychology calls it is you isolate and identify contributing factors to maladaptive thoughts and behavior. And so you identify family members as contributing factors to drug use. That's maladaptive thoughts and behavior. And like I'm turning 42 this month on the 22nd, and I don't talk with any of my family. 
<laughs> my mother, my father, my brother, those are the only three, uh, you know, immediate family that I have, but even the extended family, because they all do drugs. So it sounds like you're kind of gaining a long-term plan for your life. I mean, you're going to school and you have a side job, you got your own apartment. But my question is, um, does it, are you willing to choose your sobriety long-term over a relationship with your mother, basically? Yeah. Um, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think a lot of people have definitely struggled with that um, for a long time. Um, I know a lot of like my friends within the program have struggled with that. For me, um, I'm not so much letting my family bring me down. Um, with my mother, it's going to be a relationship where um, I will stay in contact and I will be around you and I'm going to hold my boundaries where you're not going to drink around me and you're not going to do this around me. And we can go to dinner and we can have a nice time, but that's it. Um, I'm not going to complete. I'm not, we're not going to be together all the time, right? Because I have my own life. And it's the same with my sisters where um, they, they don't smoke around me. I mean, they still do um, like whatever they want to do, but when they're around me, they respect my boundaries. And so that's why I'm so close with them. Um, because they, they respect me. I mean, it's, it's kind of luck of the draw. I'm just really glad that they, that they're able to do that for me. But for me, it's holding my boundaries. If I'm going to be around somebody, if I'm going to invest in a relationship with them, there's no point if they're not going to respect me and how I feel. That's good. Um, that's really good. Um, Jill has a question. Thank you for your, your uh, question, um, Gabe. And Jill's question is, a lot of times for people with cannabis use disorder, their only hobby is using THC. Did you find other things to do, hobbies, once you were sober? Uh, lots of hobbies. Lots of hobbies. Um, I'm a little bit under the weather right now. I have a cold. Um, uh, lots of hobbies. Um, mountain biking became a really big one for me. Um, there is a program called Riders in Recovery that's ran by a few people within Cornerstone. Um, and I was very, very scared of it at first because uh, mountain biking is scary. Um, and I'm still not like super great at it. Um, but I can, I can go a few months without falling down. Um, but I mean, that was just a huge hobby for me because, um, it pushes me, it gets me out of my comfort zone i'm in with a community that pushes themselves and strives to do better and strives to never give up um and that was extremely difficult for me and so um i ended up going on a uh, a, a, a bike trip to sun valley idaho with them and it was the hardest and like funnest thing i've ever done in my entire life um just waking up in the morning and hitting mountaintops um uphill is not my strong suit um but downhill was incredible um a lot of miles a lot of pain a lot of sweat and tears um but that was just something that i filled my time with and so like training for those bike trips definitely took up a big portion of my time um yoga um, I really like to do yoga at uh, Big Power Yoga down here in Houston. They have lots of like challenges and stuff where you do like five classes a week. And then we do like a big celebration afterwards. Um, trying to think of hobbies. Um, I really like to go do like uh, trips with my friends and stuff like that. And so this summer, um, I definitely have a few um like trips for like national parks and stuff like that within Texas, like the Narrows and um, a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I don't know. I'm really into, I'm really into cars, um, car shows, all that kind of good stuff. Um, trying to think of other hobbies. I mean, mostly what I do in my schedule is just full of mountain biking, yoga, and, uh, program stuff like meetings and, uh, family nights with like my sponsor and sponsees and work. Um, and so that's mainly what I fill up my time up with. And, and just to piggyback on what Ethan's saying, and then I have a couple questions because you used a couple more terminology there that the audience might not be familiar with. Um, um, 
the cornerstone community and is called an APG, an alternative peer group. And there's like five or six in the Houston area. The Houston area is like ground zero for the youth recovery movement. And um, what they termed is called enthusiastic recovery. So recovery to these programs is not just meetings and you know, doing your step work and talking about your feelings and the trauma you've been through and the reasons why you are using. It's about like having a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah. And that is probably one of the most powerful things about any kind of community that you can find for recovery. So look for it in your areas. I know there's the Phoenix House. They do a lot of fun, sober, like social events, but I can tell you like Ethan and I are both awakened from this program. I mean, we graduated, we've done our work. We're not like a part of it. We're alumni now, but I did, I did, I did yoga next to Ethan last Tuesday like, and I'm so happy. So it's called enthusiastic recovery and look for that in your areas. Cause there, that there's a lot of programs and communities that'll do that. And you can find some sober activities where you have fun. Um, and, and I watched these young people still, like you said, they were taking trips together. I think there was a group of them that just went to Colorado and did a bunch of skiing. Were, yeah. you, were you with that group? Did you go? I was not that? with that group. That's a very expensive trip. <laughs> yeah. Skiing's very expensive. Um, so yeah. And um, okay. And then you just used a couple terms that I wanted to clarify. I forget what they were. Um, but you just said it in your response about, um, oh, describe what your program looks like right now. Like how many meetings do you attend a week and what do you, what do you do to keep yourself in check with that? Um, so right now I just moved out of my apartment in Houston. Um, it was a not so great area. And so, um, we had an incident, um, and we decided that we were no longer going to be living right next to the Galleria. Um, and my father opened his doors. And so we moved back into my father's house for a much cheaper rent and stuff like that. So I'm in Clear Lake in League City right now, um, which is 45 minutes away from my recovery in Houston. And so um, we just moved in, I think, like three weeks ago. And so I'm out here in Clear Lake exploring more meetings. And um, they have a couple like YPAW scenes out here. YPAW is uh, basically just a big recovery community for young teens um, within AA. Um, there, my, my schedule right now looks like, um, a Monday night meeting. Um, on Tuesdays, I meet up with my sponsor at night, um, and, uh, with all of his other sponsees and we go over step work and we talk about our weeks and what we're struggling with. And we break down how we're feeling and, and solution with that. Um, oh, that's and then that's Ethan, you use the term family night. Yeah, family night. That's what a family night is. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we break down everything that we need to. We talk about solution. We talk about what tools we can use. And then it's a weekly thing. So the next week, you can only go so long without fixing the problem um, because you're just going to like he's like my sponsor is just going to call me out on it. Um, and so um, it's really, really good accountability there. Um, I stay the night at some of my friend's houses and stuff like that um, throughout the city just to kind of get a little bit of fellowship. It also saves me some driving 45 minutes away. Um, so I stay with some of my best friends up in Houston. Um, on Friday nights, I hang out with a bunch of guys. We call it guys night. Um, we just go do stupid things that um, most of the time are legal. Um <laughs> Yeah, no more U-Hauls, no, no, no more of that. Um, but uh, um, right now it's up in shambles just because I'm in the middle of a move. So right now it's a consistent one, uh, one meeting, um, and 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 yoga every couple of weeks. But um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks I can start going back to mountain biking and yoga on a more consistent schedule, um, and and find some meetings out here in Clear Lake that I can attend to. Um, regularly, but when I was in Cornerstone, it was um, at least four or five meetings a week um, mm -hmm. within yeah. built in built built in within my schedule with tons of other fellowship throughout my week. And then when you were an outpatient, you went you did a meeting every day, right? Yeah, yeah. In outpatient, um, one of the requirements is a meeting every single day. So we would do outpatient four times a week, a meeting every single day, 
um, and lots of other requirements throughout the day of like commitments and stuff that we have to complete before we go to sleep and, and reading like the God memorandum and all this like really cool stuff. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, somebody's honking out here. Um, Peter has a question. If you want to unmute Peter and uh, and show, you know, un turn your video on, you can ask that. And then we'll go to Mike and Maria. Hi, Ethan. I can relate to single track and, and uh, gravel riding. I started oh, about 10 years ago in my late 50s, and I still fall down a lot. And uh, yeah, you get used to that after a while. Yeah, Those you do. Bones have trouble with it. But it's great. It's great camaraderie. One of the questions I have is, as you built this new sort of circle of friends and family that are not using, there's so much normalization of marijuana use right now in the media and social media. You're based on your experiences and, and your dialogue with your friends. What do you think are the most important messages we get out to the younger kids, like when you were young, and, and you know, get them to understand the risks involved with using? So... Man, that is a very good question. Um, there's a lot of risk with it. Um, the message that I would send out, uh, I was telling Aubrey before this meeting started um, that uh, people would come to my school and they would talk about how like marijuana is bad for you and all this kind of stuff. But um, of course, as a teenager, you believe everything on the internet and you're like, no, it's not like it's good for me. It makes me feel happy. Like what's so wrong with that? Um, and I think within the community, um, not the recovery community, but um, I think within the younger community right now, it's more treated like alcohol um, because it's legalized and um, there's all these studies and all that kind of stuff um, where these big businesses are like promoting um, how it's good for you and how it's a medicine and how it's like helping people, but they're not showing the actual side effects um of like the downslope of where like people are like um losing their minds essentially um because i think a lot of parents are supportive of it today and this is just what i experienced within living up north in um the woodlands um in, in the woodlands texas um a lot of parents are like oh it's just weed it's not a big problem weed for them when they were teenagers was nothing like it is today. It is, it was not potent. It was just really crappy, like dry stuff in the eighties. And today it's grown in labs and it's completely different. Um, it's completely different. It's extremely potent. I mean, it's just pressed into these like goos and all this stuff, um, where it's just so much more accessible and easier to hide. Um, the message that I would send out to kids, that is a difficult message, man. It is hard to get a kid to listen to you. Um, and cause you can't even threaten like college or whatever it is to be taken away. I mean, it's just no, but like at, at, you get to a point as a, as a, as a teenager and you're like, I just don't care anymore. Um, and, and you don't want to listen to anything. I think the message that I would send and I've done a few I've done a few things where I've gone to um, some churches and spoken to youth groups and stuff like that. And I'm, and I'm hoping that the seed has been planted and um, that it might grow later on down the road um, and know that they have a place to go. I think the message that I would send is um, it's not worth it. Um, it's 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 not a quick fix. It's not instant. I mean, it is instant relief. It's instant gratification, but it just does so many things to you down the line. That's not worth it. And so. Um, that is a difficult question. Um, no, no, I thank you. It is a difficult question because I'm in <laughs> Iowa and we're actually working on this stuff. And I work with a lot of kids and teens and it's it's like a holy grail. We're looking for that answer <laughs> there's no i don't i don't there there probably is but i don't even think i have that answer i mean um i mean it just takes so much to get a teenager to listen man i mean it takes a lot of beating a dead horse to get the point across um well you've got an amazing message and a great story so <laughs> congratulations on what you've accomplished these are Thank great. You. It's great. Planting seeds. I think that idea that you shared is a really good one. So I definitely. I'm, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've helped a lot of kids get sober and most of them did not stay sober. Right. And so 
Um, I don't feel bad. I don't regret anything that I did for them. Um, I do not feel like I wasted my time. A lot of people do feel like that sometimes. I don't feel like I wasted my time whatsoever because later on down in their life, maybe when they're 30, maybe when they're 40, maybe when they're 50, they'll look back and remember, oh, this kid was telling me something that was right. This kid was telling me that there's hope and that there's strength somewhere out there for me. And they know that there's meetings and there's communities and places for them to be. And so um, that honestly might be the message that I would send to a kid um, because they're not going to listen. They need to learn. They need to screw up. They need to get, um, they, they need to, they need to, to lose some teeth um, to, to kind of learn sometimes. And so just letting them know that there is a place and that there is a community out there for them. Cause when I was getting sober, I didn't think it existed because everybody wanted to be cool. Everybody wanted to party. Everybody wanted to like steal cars and, 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 bat mailboxes and do whatever they wanted to do to have fun. But um, I didn't think a community like this ever existed. So. Yeah. Just to piggyback on Peter's question, because that is such, that's why this, uh, the cornerstone program that we talk about is such a parent driven <coughs> program. And that's why Ethan's uh, story is even extra special because um, it is like drawn into the parents about account, hold on, Gabe, about accountability and, actionable about you know responses to the the kid the youth behaviors and, and and stuff like that so I do a presentation about that what I've learned in this community about setting those boundaries implementing them and, and holding them and it's it can be a very painful experience but um but but the the positive peer pressure that that like Ethan gives to the other youth and the example he sets that you know that He's a, he shines his light like they're like they're like Ethan's cool. I want to be just like you know. I've seen it before. I'm gonna mute because my dogs are lifting up. But Mike and Maria, hold on, Gabe. We'll get back to you. We'll swing back. But Mike and Maria, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. How you doing, Ethan? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your share. It was very inspirational. Um, our son is, is also 20 and he's in a sober living is, is, and is doing some IOP. He's had some, uh, some, some full-time, um, you know, 30 day stays. Um, but I know a big part of his, seems like his resistance is like a lot of the formality of, you know, maybe the program and the steps and, and, I was just wondering if you kind of felt that way also when you were first going through like the, four, you know, the steps being, you know, kind of off putting and, and formal and sort of how uh, did you get over that if, if you, if you did, if you did uh, feel that way. Definitely. Um, as a teenager, you look forward to going to college and getting as messed up as humanly possible um, because that's what we're told. That's what um, you're supposed to supposed to look forward to whenever you're in high school is like, man, you got to get accepted into this college and then you can party as much as you want. Um, and so for me, that was really difficult when I got sober, because um, after about a year or two of being sober, I was still um, kind of had that thought in the back of my mind, like, man, like, I'm never going to be able to do that. Like, that sucks. Um, my resistance with the steps, um, it took me a long time to get through the steps. It took me a very long time. Um, I was more interested in, I was very lucky because the friends that I had were sober, right? I was more interested in having fun with those people, um, than like working on myself and bettering myself. Um, but the steps just meant honesty and I was not interested and um, giving out my secrets. I was very willing to take what, um, what I've done to the grave and never talk about it again and stuff it. Um, and so that was a very big turn off for me for the steps. I was not interested in that. Um, I mean, I just got pushed. I mean, positive peer pressure, like Aubrey said, um, that's the only reason that um, I even, that I even started to gradually pick up on it and start getting it done. Um, 
was that positive peer pressure because I mean, I have like, a, I had these, these, these really cool people in my life and I'm watching them experience these, like, um, these weights lifted off their shoulders and how free they feel and how like honesty is like their freedom from their self-deception. And I'm just sitting there sulking because I still want to lie to be cool. I still, um, don't want to talk about, um, what I've done because I'm afraid of the consequences and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, definitely for a young person to get sober, um, is a difficult task just because it, just because they feel like it's going to be forever and ever. Um, because forever and ever is a really long time. Um, and so something that I kind of had to tell myself that I don't know if it's, if it's exactly positive or good. Um, but I just had to tell myself that like, um, this may not be forever, but it's all I want to do for today. And so, um, that, that, that just for today thing was a, it was a cliche that's always said, but I mean, it was a very big thing for me. Um, and it somehow worked for three and a half years. And so, um, still here, um, still extremely interested in, um, doing the steps. I'm, I'm, I'm going over the steps again right now. Um, still extremely interested in um, like the program and the community and building off of that and being a leader. And so um, it's just difficult for a teenager to get to that point. Um, even a 20 year old, um, we're not exactly the smartest people in the world. Um, and so it's, it's just a difficult task to, to do because I mean, you can have like these um, like, you can have this like really cool group of like, um, of like 10 or 10 or 20 dudes that really supports you in, in staying sober. But I mean, if he chooses the other life, he has millions of people that he could be friends with because they all just want to get messed up and they just want to do what they want to do. And so, um, it's an easy exit strategy, right? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a difficult task. Um, but I mean, the family support is massive. Um, somehow I did it. Um, I kind of just banked off all of my friends' parents, um, which which worked out pretty well for me. Um, but I mean, I was I was jealous of how some parents cared so much. Um, and there is definitely miracles out there. I had one of my best friends get a year sober last night or a couple of days ago, but we celebrated it last night. And it was um, it's it's just incredible because I never thought I, I didn't think that kid was going to make it. I didn't think he was going to live. I mean, countless relapses, treatment centers, all of this stuff. And, and I was his first sponsor. And that's what I meant by drama mamas was um, like, I didn't know if I could help this kid. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and I couldn't, and he found somebody that could. Um, and so um, I definitely helped somewhere along the way, but I mean, yeah, I mean, there's definitely miracles out there. So, and and Ethan is referring to Rowan. We can we can say that because Rowan has shared his testimony here, okay. and um, so it's okay. Um, and um, and yeah, that's you did help. You did help Rowan. I watched you help Rowan many many times. I helped watch this whole community, and it was it was a miracle last night. Do we have Gabe? Gabe, did you want to make a quick comment, and then we just want to? Oh, I want to get to a couple comments here. Hold on, Gabe. Um, Julie says, congratulations on your sobriety, Ethan. Doreen, Thank you. Bar, Doreen, I'm so glad you're here tonight. My love to you. I haven't seen you in a few years, but Doreen said, thank you, Ethan. You are very brave to tell your story. Um, Mary by the Bay says, thank you, Ethan, for your strength to share your story. And Mary Moss says, thank you, Ethan. Congrats on your sobriety and your positive life journey. Thank so, you, guys. Lots of great feedback here. Okay, Gabe, do you have a quick comment you want to make? Well, just to what Peter said, um, what I find works with the youth is not the approach of the boomers. <laughs> it's uh, I, I uh, do a lot of this on social media, and it, you can call them debates, but really there's a big display of cognitive dissonance from the users as well as the fact that marijuana causes a cognitive deficit because they're saying things like, if you tell a teenager the pernicious nature of marijuana, 
deceptive. That's too many multi-syllabic words. So I, 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 I think this group's a little too soft on that. I just go, uh, I get screenshots of the latest marijuana cause of homicides. You can Google this. There's new ones every month. You can also go to Parents Posed a Pot and show, uh, you know, really, really dark stuff that is directly linked to marijuana, like where kids have died, babies have died because the parents are getting stoned. They space the baby out in the car and things like that. And uh, that, that's been effective. I actually had someone tell me they quit smoking weed because of me, just because of the things that I did on the internet that get my accounts banned for violating terms of service. But it made someone quit smoking weed. So I think that's where it is. Yeah, the nice approach doesn't work with teenagers in my Yeah, life. and you know, and, and to each his own. It might work with some and not might with other and it, it all. There's a there's a great video we have on our YouTube channel for the stages of change. And it gives us um, kind of like a cookie cutter approach of, you know, when the person's in deep denial, what what are what are your appropriate responses? What can you do? And then when they're willing, like the the uh, psychologist who teaches this uh, stages of change, she says, you throw everything at them in the kitchen sink. Like you just give them all the resources, all the options to get better and quit using and all that kind of stuff. But but it's a hard, tricky game. You know, it really is. Like everybody's different. Every parenting skill is different. So that's why Support meetings, not only for the youth, but for the family members, whether they're the parents, the sisters, the brothers, the aunts and uncles, the grandparents, is, is what I preach. You know, work your program, and through the strength of these communities, you do find the answers. You hear other people's experience, strength, and hope, and then the ones you relate to, you're like, I'm going to try it. Or maybe you say, there's no way I can do what that other person did. And it's, it's this um, crazy journey but it does bring a lot of hope and it brings more resources and more actionable items that we can choose um, to be that shining light that Ethan is, you know, and um, and, and, and Gabe has su survived a, a horrific experience, you know, throughout his life. He's a, he's a shining light too. And so many of you are, because I know your story is here. So thank you for your comment, Gabe. Um, anybody else with a comment or a question? Okay, Ethan, I got two quick questions and then we'll call it a night. If there's uh -huh. nothing else that chimes in. Oh, Doreen, Doreen has her hand up. Go ahead, Doreen. I think she's coming on. There we go. Thank you, Ethan, for sharing your story. Um, it's very impactful. I have a question for you. Um, when you say that you're, um, you're sober, you know, you have, so long in sobriety is that um like can you do you still go out with your friends and have a beer or is that everything that's everything okay do you find that um my son was 25 um when he started you know he went to rehab and then you know working the steps and it was the hardest thing for him to go out with his friends and, you know, just not even to have a beer. And he would say to me, oh, mom, I can have just, you know, a beer. I'm not smoking pot or doing any drugs or it's just a beer. That can work for some. So I've seen a couple of cases um, within my time getting sober and working with a few people um, of where that has worked. Um, I will tell you for from almost all of them it doesn't um with alcoholics and addicts it's always just starts with one um for me i mean um what what people will what people will call it is is california sober for like people who are trying to um quit alcohol they call it california sober where they'll just smoke weed um it kind of it can be the same thing of turning it back. I mean, a substance is a substance. Um, I think from, from, from just what I've seen, um, one beer for me is not an option. Um, I do smoke cigarettes from time to time. Um, I, I don't find, I, I know they're harmful, but, um, I don't find it as a mind altering substance, um, or a drink or anything. Um, but I mean, uh, a beer isn't an option for me because whenever it's just one, it turns into many, many others. 
Um, and that leads me down roads where I don't want to be. Um, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. It did. Thank you. That, that was a great question during and great question in honor of your son. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Yeah, Ryan. We'll, we'll speak Ryan's name right now. And um, we've got some more comments here. Um, we have you are a very inspiring young man, Ethan. Thank you so much for sharing from Mike and Maria. Claire says, thank you for sharing your story, Ethan. So inspiring. Alexis says, Ethan, so, so proud of you. Thank you for sharing. Keep sharing. And Nancy says, thank you, Ethan. Love you. So proud of you. So thank you, Ethan. Um, thank you. I